This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. Mino Studio is a pre- and post-production facility for all of your audio needs. Mino Studio's founder is an accredited audio engineer with top 40 and in indie album credits. With over 30 years of music industry experience, Mino Studio can take your podcast from idea to reality. Contact Mino Studio at Mino Studio 777 at gmail.com for more information. That's Mino Studio spelled M E N O, Mino Studio 777 at gmail.com. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man. One desire, one challenge, dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manassero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manassero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays. And if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, we've got a great show today for you. A couple of gentlemen that have a fantastic background that have uh, formed their own uh, real estate investing uh, company. And I'm going to first give you a little background on them both. They both are co-founders of Joint Ops Properties, LLC. Both of these gentlemen are two United States military officers and Academy of Graduates. In 2014, Jim Vreeland uh, partnered with Bob Scott to create this organization and capitalize on a unique opportunity in the U.S. real estate market. With decades of experience between them and an emphasis on the St. Louis area, Joint Ops Properties has been able to secure over 100 distressed properties, often at just 30 to 40 cents on the dollar, resulting in day one equity for their investors. Joint Ops currently focuses on single family homes and tenants seeking a lease to own option, resulting in tenant buyers with more skin in the game, as opposed to a traditional tenant with no long-term interest in the home. Let me tell you a little bit about these guys. Uh, Jim Vreeland is a 2003 graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point, an Army Black Knight football alumni. After receiving his commission, he joined the force as an Army Field Artillery Officer, where he would serve a deployment to Iraq in 2005 with the 3rd Infantry Division. Subsequently, becoming U.S. Army Ranger, he would deploy again to Iraq with the 2nd Ranger Battalion as a fire support officer in 2006, followed by a tour to to Afghanistan in 2007. Exiting the Army at the rank of captain in 2008, Jimmy set out to make an impact in the private sector through sales at Stryker Orthopedics. In less than two years, he became the highest grossing rep for the St. Louis branch and held that title for the next six years. In 2014, Jimmy partnered with fellow U.S. Military Academy grad 
Bob Scott to form Joint Ops Properties. Let me tell you about Bob. Bob is originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and grew up working in his family's antique and retail business, where he learned at first hand the value of customer service at a young age. After graduating from high school with two state championships under his belt, one in football and one in baseball, he went on to play varsity football at the U.S. Air Force Academy and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. While in the active duty Air Force, Bob managed construction projects ranging from facility renovation at Elgin Air Force Base in Florida to new construction of multi-million dollar facilities in Baghdad, Iraq. Bob finished his service with the rank of captain and decided to jump into the world of real estate investing. An avid investor, Bob is an expert at structuring real estate transactions of all types, wholesaling, flip and fix, subject to auctions, REOs, short sales, work for equity, and sandwich lease options. Bob co-authored the book, The Ultimate Real Estate Survival Guide, published by Celebrity Press. In his free time, Bob loves to scuba dive, snowboard, wakeboard, and travel. He's also an avid reader and passionate about self-improvement. Woo, well, that's a mouthful there. Boy, you guys, uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm Thanks doing for having us. Good yeah. to be here. Oh, man, we're glad to have you guys here and uh, certainly proud of the service that you had for our country. Uh, really, uh, really a pleasure to, to be able to talk to you guys. So, yeah, likewise. Pleasure's on our side. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We have a lot of, a lot of uh, ex-military people and some that are still in the military that are investors that looked at that as their sort of their long-term retirement plan. And some are not so long-term. We had a gentleman that was an officer in the Navy that was retired and had started uh, you know, just before he left and uh, is now uh, looking at real estate investing as a means to be able to finance his retirement. So it looks like a, a good thing that works out for those that can in the military. Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at real estate as a short-term retirement plan. Yeah, I like that. I definitely like that. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I kind of gave an overview, but you know what I'd be really interested in is why a real estate investing? How did you guys end up in that, you know, all the areas you could have gone? So like going overseas and being in combat areas, you won't see this on the movies, but there is so much time on your hands and so much boredom between missions. So in a four month deployment, I probably read probably two books a week and I, I can definitely remember being in Afghanistan and reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and just every concept in there. I was like, this is for me. I think Bob will second this. Anybody who goes to a military academy is a pretty type A and competitive person. So obviously, I've always wanted to compete in the financial space and create wealth. And the Rich Dad, Poor Dad Poor Dad, a program of just creating enough passive income to equal your expenses, it hit home for me pretty hard. So I actually bought a house from Afghanistan. Really? While, while you were there, the entire transaction? Well, I, my brother was in med school at St. Louis University, so we we bought it together. But every time I could get on email or write home, I'm like, you know, ignore your med school studies. Let's go. Let's get a house. Wow. <laughs> and then we all, and my mom, my mom and dad were also helping us the whole time. So every time we talked, I'd be like, we get in the house yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So he kind of oversaw the inspection of the property before you purchased? Yeah, him and my mom. Uh, he actually he actually moved into it with other med school students and they were our first tenants. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you still have that property today? Yep. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's it, would you call it student housing for the most part? Is it close by the uh, university? Yeah, we were originally when he was around the med school, because he was our marketing person, we would do exclusively med school students. But now all those houses, we've done regular market tenants. What got you guys to move into the realm of um, lease option, the uh, rent to own type of uh, uh, transactions? Yeah, well, once we decided uh, that we really wanted to, to put on, put our pedal to the metal and kind of press on the gas, we started buying a ton of properties. Um, you know, my expertise was in, in finding the, de the deals, networking with some of the other wholesalers and agents in the area. Uh, and we got up to having a one four-family property and I think five or six single families. And they were all regular rentals. 
Um, and um, we, at the end of the month, we kind of looked down at our, uh, our P&L and, and realized we, we weren't really making any money. Um, you well, know, you're getting hammered, actually. Yeah, yeah. Between all the, uh, the ticky-tack repairs and maintenance uh, on properties um, and just dealing with uh, tenants in some of the neighborhoods we were buying and, and trying to track down rent, um, all those things added up to, to us not making any money. So um, I attended one of my local RIA meetings and heard a guy talk about lease options. Um, and it just sounded like the perfect avenue for us. And, and we pivoted to doing lease options. And that's been a complete game changer for us. Um, and for those that, that aren't real familiar with a lease option, uh, basically, we are, are giving the tenant uh, buyer a right to purchase a property from us. Um, we typically do a two-year option, and in exchange, they give us a non-refundable option deposit up front when they move in. It's not like a security deposit, so it, it's non-refundable. They, they know that's going to us, and they're not getting it back. And uh, and for us in our market, that's anywhere between three to $10,000 up front. Um, so you can really see how that changes the dynamic of a rental when your tenant buyer is giving you that kind of money up front. That's a lot of skin in the game. Um, so, so these folks have a completely different mindset from a traditional tenant. You know, they, they want to be owners. They understand the value of holding real estate long term. Um, they've just had some kind of minor bump in the road in their financial history that's preventing them from qualifying right now. You know, a lot of times it's a credit issue. Um, some folks are self-employed. Um, or own their own business. And then a lot of other folks are just new to the St. Louis area and, and a traditional bank will not um, talk to them until they have six months on the job. Um, so we're kind of that bridge to get these folks to the point of, of buying a property. Now, um, so there's sort of that two-year period where they're, uh, they're basically renting from you. Um, but now those funds are all applied to the purchase price. Is that correct? Or part correct. Of those That's funds? right. Okay. Right. When they exercise the option, all of their, uh, their option deposit down payment is credited towards the purchase price. And the banks recognize it as far as the down payment. Okay. Gotcha. And do you uh, – uh, do you help them define the financing or they have to do that on their own? No, at closing, there's a mortgage professional at the closing with them. And then we have an incentive program that there's different, uh, there's five steps they have to get through. And at each step, we incentivize them by giving them a break in the rent or a little bit off the purchase price just to keep them in the game and keep the ball rolling. And then as soon as they're qualified, the mortgage professional who they've known for for a significant amount of time now is in contact with them and helps them purchase through. Gotcha. So when you're buying these houses, and one of the things that, that your promotional material uh, mentions is that you know from day one they've got equity. Um, so are you generally going in? You're are you buying yeah, uh, you know properties that are you know real, real bad shape, and you fix them up, uh, or uh, what happens there? Yeah, we, we buy a lot of uh, distressed properties. Um, probably I'd say 70, 80 percent of what we're buying is REOs, you know, bank foreclosures, um, HUD foreclosures, Fannie Mae foreclosures or short sales. Um, then the, the other percentage of the deals we're buying are probably off market, um, off market deals we get from wholesalers or, or other uh, agents. And that are also distressed for a number of reasons. You know, people who are out of state landlords and can't manage the property anymore, or properties that that need work. Do you do the rehab yourself, or do you do you just sell as is? Um, we do a little bit of both. So, um, you know, so we, we do occasionally wholesale properties out as is, but the majority of our properties, um, we do all the, the major reconstruction work on it. Um, we try to not take on any more big rehabs, any gut rehabs. Um, we've done a lot of those in the past. And we've just realized that, you know, after all is said and done, it, it's really not worth um, all the uh, the effort to, to manage a big project like that. So we prefer properties that are um, light rehabs, cosmetic rehabs, you know, um, s something where it, the property might not have been updated since, you know, 1985, 1990, but it was meticulously maintained and is clean. Um, so, you know, it's basically, you know, someone could live there. It just might not have been updated you know, the past 20 years or so. And what we found with regular rentals is we try to use the 80-20 principle. We'll do 80% of the work to get to occupancy. And then for our time and our capital, the most expensive part was that last 20%, going to meet the inspector, getting the work list after the inspection. 
So anything major we handle, but anything that the tenant can handle, we generally leave for them. Yeah, so that'd be, you know, basic basic painting and, and uh, you know, light fixtures, any minor stuff. That way our tenant buyers kind of feel a little bit more involved in the process too, and they can customize the home for themselves. And anybody who has regular rentals and has to meet the inspector and – what is the work list? Uh, yeah, just the, the, the make-ready yeah, list. Yeah, it's, yeah, punch list. It's time expensive, and it's very – it's mostly time expensive. The capital expensive, not so much, but for us it's the time. And and you're usually buying it uh, what thirty uh, percent below market or twenty uh, percent? Uh, is there sort of a rule of thumb? There? Yeah, yeah. We typically shoot for a thirty to fifty percent uh, below market. You know, based upon um, what, what we think comps are in today's today's market. And the sales price would be uh, whatever market is. Yeah, okay. yeah. Full, full price. I mean, that's the great thing about the the lease option buyers. Um, if you look at, you know, total slice of the market of, of people who want to buy a house, um, you know, it's estimated that only maybe 10 to 20 percent of that buyer pool can actually qualify for a mortgage today. So when you market your property on a lease option or owner financing, um, you're tapping into that 80 to 90 percent of the buyer's pool. And, and, and virtually nobody else is talking to them. You know, all agents um, and, and most investors and, and pretty much all home sellers, they want to sell for cash right now. I mean, that's great. I, I want to sell for cash, too. But if you can be patient and, and market your property this way, you can tap into that much larger buyer's pool. And when you do that and you're the only person in your market talking to those people, um, they're a lot less picky than a traditional buyer. So you can get away with some of the stuff we're talking about of, of selling the property at full retail price and, and not necessarily having it fixed up to the nines, You know, leaving some work to the tenants themselves. And the other big thing here that we haven't mentioned yet is, is that our tenant buyers are responsible for all the ongoing repairs and maintenance, um, which was one of the things that just killed us when we had traditional rentals. Um, so, you know, one, it, it's a cost savings, obviously, when we don't have to handle that every month. But then two, we're not managing that whole process of, of receiving the call from the tenant. Um, and then Finding the contractor. Finding the contractor, lining the contractor yeah. up. Exactly. That's what particularly drove me nuts was just that coordination. Contractor coordination, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that drives we, most of us. Can at home? Rentals. Can they get in the house? All that stuff. Right. So do you find that the tenants, for the most part, from day one, they are, even though they're not technically on a, a deed, um, you've got a lease option agreement, which basically says that, you know, that they're going to be able to exercise their right to purchase this property in two years. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Now, when you were you first started buying homes, you were just buying homes to to rent them out, right? And uh, and in in that process, saw that um, gee, you know, this is just it's not generating the cash that we thought. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Uh, we went wakeboarding one day on the beautiful Mississippi here in St. Louis, up in St. Charles, and um, we both came to the conclusion that you know we're not making the cash we thought we were making and that was frustrating us greatly and uh for whatever reason the mississippi inspires a lot of free thinking for us and so we listed everything we hated about our business and uh pretty much lease option allowed us to get rid of everything we hated so you're making up the difference obviously on the down payment um you you don't have the repairs now uh, and that down payment is also protection for us against eviction you know with a regular rental they give it was too much rent, and the deposit always goes to the agent finding the t finding the tenant. With this down payment, if eviction ever comes up you know, while the house is vacant, we still have that down payment covering the P and I and the expenses. And we know when we we take the property back, we're going to get another non refundable option deposit from from the next person we place. Now it is non refundable from from the get go, right? So correct. If yeah. for after two years they can't find fi financing, for example. Um, you still hold on to that deposit? We do, we do. And we, we're very flexible with the, the option period. You know, if someone gets to the two-year mark um, and and still wants to buy, you know, we'll typically extend it. St. Louis is a great cash flow market, so we're not in any rush to actually turn these over. If they do turn over, great, we're excited. We get that, that big payday. Um, but if not, you know, we'll just keep, keep cash flow on the property and, and keep rocking and rolling. And that payday is probably going to go into another cash flowing house anyway, so – it, it, now, is your is your cash flow higher than it was before you you introduced this program? Absolutely. 
Okay. I mean, obviously because of the, the lack of repairs and, and so forth, but um, is the actual lease payment higher than, let's say, it, the, the rent would have been? Yeah. So actually, that's another great, great point you're making is that, you know, since we're tapping into that much larger buyer's pool and we've put ourselves in this great supply demand situation, um, we can actually get above market rents for lease options occasionally. Um, so we kind of make it more of a, ne- a negotiation um, we, with all the marketing we're doing and tapping into that buyer's pool. We get a ton of interest for lease options. Um, we're getting anywhere between 300 to 400 calls per week, uh, 500 hits per day on our local um, rent on website um, and, and tons of applications um, online and, and physical form. And between all that, we, we end up getting actually multiple applications per property for lease options. So, um, we, you know, we're kind of able to, to make it a little bit of a bidding war between the tenant buyers and go back to them um, and say, hey, you know, can you come up with any additional down payment now or even sometimes into the future? Um, you know, we, we get a lot of extra down payments at tax time um, when people have that money come in. And then we also say, hey, you know, can you afford any more monthly? Um, so it doesn't happen all the time, but, you know, we do have a few properties that are two, three, four hundred dollars per month above market rents, what, what, what other landlords are getting for that exact same type of property in that same neighborhood. Wow. Wow, that's great. Now, do you screen them like you would uh, normal tenants? Absolutely. So, you know, they've got to demonstrate bad rental history. They don't have uh, credit problems and, and other things, criminal records and so forth. So, so you, they have to qualify for your program, right? Yeah, right. yeah. We, we still do full full background checks. Um, you know, we are a little bit looser on, on the credit score than some other uh, landlords might be just because, you know, that's our, our target market that we're trying to go after. You know, the big thing we look for is – is what happened to their credit? Is it kind of a, a one-time event in, in their life, or is it a repeated history? Uh, you know, a lifetime of, of bad habits, and that's really the, the differentiator. You know, someone had something come along, whether it's medical bills or temporary loss of job, and they got into a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, that, that doesn't strike them off of our list. So, yeah. Gotcha. Are you only in the St. Louis area? Currently, we are. Yeah, yeah. Our goal is to uh, to get up to about 300 properties here in this local market and potentially explore some some other opportunities. Are there tasks that you have to do where you have to sort of manage the properties uh, while they're still under uh, lease? Yeah, yeah. We we do have um, five staff members that help help with us. Obviously, we've got a quite a large portfolio and we're we're growing pretty rapidly. You know, the, the lease options has allowed us uh, to scale pretty quickly and. Um, both of our skill sets are, are, are raising capital and finding properties. So our team members kind of help us uh, with, with the screening of all the folks, um, you know, just getting back to people and, and getting them out to the properties to view it is, is a, uh, you know, takes a quite a bit of m- amount of time. And then, um, you know, we do have people kind of handle all the, the accounting, the bookkeeping and the day to day administration of the rental properties. Because we're incredibly bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not fun. you know. <laughs> but, well, like when I was first starting out, I, I would be like, Bob, I've only, you know, I used to think I was the most disorganized and least follow through academy graduate I've ever met. And, <laughs> and then I met you. <laughs> but I thought all military guys were, you know, they're structured and, and you know, had everything down, organized and, uh, you know, real type A. Well, I mean, when you're forced to because you're in the military, we are. But, you know, after we were able to flower when, <laughs> when we got out, old habits came back. Like, <laughs> I love it. Well, in your investing venture here, what, what would you say was your, your biggest mistake? I mean, I'd say it was it was doing regular rentals, and that was just um, from a complete lack of, of knowledge. You know, everybody out there talks about, um, d- d- you know, doing rentals. Well, we were kind of XL millionaires, Bill. And <laughs> on our YouTube channel, we have a video talking about our first deal was this multifamily in St. Louis, and we are so excited. And our our Excel sheet showed us we were going to be absolute millionaires, and. <laughs> It was a complete bust. Yeah, yeah. We, there was a four family. You know, we were we could be all in for for about eighty, eighty three, eighty four thousand dollars, and and gross monthly rents. Uh, I think we're right around twenty three fifty a month. You know, taxes in St. Louis are pretty cheap, so is insurance. So I think we, we were going to end up cash flowing this one property um, around seven hundred bucks a month. Um, but you know, the, the property uh, was in kind of a borderline neighborhood. Um, two uh, or one of the units was a one bedroom. Two of the units. 
units were, were two bedrooms. And with the neighborhood and, and the small units, um, you know, I think we were getting $450 per month rent off one unit, $550 off another. And, and you know, the folks had no skin in the game. It was an older property, so there was tons of uh, ongoing repairs and maintenance. And we, we never seemed to get that 650 bucks per month cash flow. <laughs> yeah, I, and I... If you want to know more about it, we put it all in our XL Millionaires YouTube video. But <laughs> I mean, so you're I'm a, <laughs> like I'm a high energy, quick start type of person. So when mm-hmm. I see something excite that excites me, I got really excited. And it was like on a Tuesday, and we were doing like champagne showers off this thing on our Excel sheet, and it was <laughs> my disappointment was so miserable. <laughs> So, so you'd say your biggest mistake was really not understanding the real dynamics of developing an effective Excel spreadsheet for <laughs> real estate investing, right? It turns out in real life, Bill, that uh, the model doesn't always fit reality. That right. was, it was a hard thing to discover. Right. You got that. And well, I got to imagine that's got to be anybody getting into real estate. That's got to be – I'm sure we're not the only one to make that mistake. No, I think I think we all have uh, archives of Excel spreadsheets like that and inexperiences where, gee, it, it was supposed to generate, you know, this and uh, unfortunately didn't. Um, how, what would you say conversely was sort of your, your biggest success then? Well, we've got one property we like to call our, our kind of crown jewel in the portfolio. So this is property on, uh, on Mohand. And um, this was a short sale deal that we uh, we picked up from an agent. Um, agent had been negotiating it for a few months, and um, you know we've we've been around the St. Louis market, rubbing elbows with all the other investors and agents who who deal with investment properties. And uh, so they brought this property directly to us. It was it was kind of a, a pocket listing. Needed to close it quickly, and and knew we were some you know um, legitimate buyers and could close on deals. And uh, this was a four bed, three bath house. Uh, 2,300 square feet on an acre of land uh, in a great, great area of St. Louis, Florissant. Uh, we ended up purchasing this property and we were all in it for $75,000, which is, is a great deal. Um, we actually had the property appraised um, within a few months after we bought it for $155,000. So tons of equity in the deal, um, you know, $65,000, $70,000 worth of equity. And um, with the property being so large, with a ton of land, a very unique deal, uh, we had a ton of interest from our lease option buyers and we ended up finding a tenant buyer um, to put eight thousand dollars down within i want to say two three weeks of us actually buying the property um so so moved very quickly and we ended up getting uh fifteen hundred and thirty five dollars per month rent off that property so you know after after we ended up securing uh we ended up buying the property with the private lender and then refinancing it, uh, our lender out and getting long-term commercial financing on there. And uh, after all said and done, I think it's cash flowing around $750 per month. And uh, and with our tenant buyer putting down $8,000, you know, that's a, that's a ton of skin in the game. So um, we don't ever worry about, you know, are they going to pay their rent this month or not? You know, they've, they've got a lot to walk away from. So it's a hell of an incentive. And it's a very, you know, easy, easy way to uh, manage properties and, and to get our cash this, flow. This house is beautiful. If anybody's curious, it's uh, it's called Mohan, and we did a video on our YouTube channel too. Oh, great! We're well, gonna have to give us a link at the end of this uh, to your YouTube channel so people can uh, catch out that and your uh, millionaire Excel uh, video. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, you know, a lot of our, our listeners are folks that are 50 plus. Uh, some are uh, approaching retirement and, and concerned. Um, some are in retirement and, and already, you know, maybe dealing with the, a, a lack of cash flow. Some of them may not have the funds to really make some major, major investments, but they're interested in, in getting in, involved in real estate as a means to be able to supplement uh, the retirement. What would you guys advise, you know, for, for folks, maybe they're on fixed incomes and limited reserves, uh, how would you advise them to get started and, and succeed in, in this arena? If I was in this sort of situation, we advise all our investors to do this, but I would go buy a whole life insurance policy and take over the bank banking function for yourself. Explain that. So we, we came to this revelation probably six or seven months ago because the banks were beating us up for liquidity. And... Uh, our stance was like, we're not going to leave $200,000 in a deposit bank or we, you know, if we have $200,000, we're going to go buy four houses and get more cash flow. 
So we had we were not going to put liquid capital in a bank. And we had heard other podcasts like Mike Dillard talked about this, but it's called the infinite banking concept. And you can use a whole life policy just like you use any piece of real estate property. So on your balance sheet, it's liquid cash and you can take policy loans from you can take a policy loan from the property and then you go buy life insurance with it. Like that's what I did. That's what any money I had in a savings account, that's what I've done. Interesting. Wow. Wow. That's and a then, neat approach. And then we also, you know, every real estate investor has to leave money aside for taxes, right? Yeah, yep. And I hate seeing liquid fiat currency in a bank. So what we've done is we bought a policy and any money we are escrowing for taxes, we now put into a whole life insurance policy, which is another asset on our balance sheet, which makes the banks happier. And at the end of the year, we pull a policy loan and then pay our taxes that way. And the magic of that is we're still getting a 5% dividend on that money, even though we've given it to the government. Wow, that's a uh, really interesting approach. Um, like we, we could do a three hour podcast on this and how it makes your brain, um, but I would just go read Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. Oh, great. I will put a link on that. And for those of you listening, too, we we will be taking everything that's in this podcast and putting it in our show notes on olddogsreinetwork.com, including the book he just mentioned, uh, as well as other links that they uh, speak of as well. So, uh, but I, you know, I have to imagine a lot of your 50 plus audience already have these life insurance policies with a bunch of cash value built up and they it's just a dormant asset sitting there. Right, right. That's very, very possible. You, you're you probably right on on that. So if they have any cash value, pull that out in a policy loan, put it into real estate, and that's, you know, that gets you started. That's great. Great idea. And before investors give us money, we generally tell them, hey, put in a whole policy loan and then give us the money. Right. Great. So their money's making, they're making interest in two places. They're making money on the policy and they're also making money with us. And there are certain tax advantages by doing this as well. That's great. What's ahead for you guys? What, what's the long-term plan for your organization? Well, we want to get to 300 properties in St. Louis. We probably want to throw on a turnkey business as well. And then being academy grads, we have a full network of people just like us. So we think we could team up with them and put the exact same system in place and kind of go. I don't think this model would work on either coast, but... Generally, throughout the Midwest and Southwest, I think the model could work. So you need a, a lower price home for the most part in order for, for it to work. Well, to start with private money, like it's just not going to work in California to go try to find two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar private money loans. But we're picking up houses from thirty to fifty k, and it's not that hard to find private investors with that kind of money to give you. Oh, that's great. The other thing about our system is we do one investor, one property. We don't fund or pool any money. Oh, great. Well, uh, wow, you've uh, given us a lot of great information. I, I like the fact that you guys may you know, move into uh, teaching others how to do what you guys do. That sounds like a, a very promising venture as well. I mean, yeah, this is kind of, at least for me, it's my hobby. I love just talking about this stuff. So we'd love to go show other people how to do it. Yep. Great, great. Well, this is the part of our, our interview where we would sort of wrap it up here. And I uh, uh, ask you a series of real quick questions, and uh, you guys can respond. I don't know with two guys how we're going to do that, because uh, <laughs> uh, maybe you'll just have to each give your, your response. But we yeah, kind of do it as quickly as we can. Um, uh, there are five questions that we ask, and I'll just uh, go ahead and get started now with the wrap it up. Favorite real estate book? All right. It's, uh, it's funny you brought that up because actually I, I'm launching a book today, The Ultimate Real Estate Survival Guide, uh, as published by Celebrity Press. Um, I've kind of gotten together with a bunch of experts in the real estate industry, and we, we've all shared our uh, most valuable secrets when it comes to real estate investing. Uh, the section I did talked all about mastering the mental game of real estate. So obviously, I'm going to say my own book is the best. <laughs> and I, and I'll endorse Bob by saying that he's like the Dr. Phil for real estate investors. I'll come in all nervous and hot and bothered about things, and you know he calms me down. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. 
Now, is the book available yet? Uh, or? It is. It's available on Amazon today, actually. First day oh, it's out there. Yeah, and and if, awesome. and if you sign up today, there, there's a ton of bonuses um, online. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give our contact information later on here. That's great. Okay. Uh, how about your favorite business book? We got to go with Anti-Fragile by uh, Nassim Taleb. Great. How about most valuable website for success other than your own? Strategic Coach, uh, Dan Sullivan's program. Uh, great. And favorite app? For me, it's the podcasting app. I probably listen to two to three hours of podcasting a day. Yeah, anytime we're in the car, always, always learning. Same here, total podcast junkie here. All right, well, the last question is, if everything fell apart and you, boom, you all you had left was $1,000 in the bank um how would you what would you do to launch your real estate business to get it back again with that one thousand dollars well the great thing about real estate is there's a ton of ways to make money without actually having any of your own um you, you know when i got started it was wholesaling um and if i had to do it again i would um also you can do subject to deals which is where you take over other people's loans um, and you can also do sandwich lease option deals. You know, we still do these deals today, even though we have a lot of access to capital, it's still great um, to do deals that, that don't require it. And, and there's tons of deals out there. You just you just gotta get out in the market and uh, and start hustling and go to RIA meetings, network with other investors and, and do some marketing directly to some home sellers. And, and you'll find the deals in your market that you can make some money off of without it, having any cash in your own pocket. That's great, great, great advice. Well, how can people get a hold of you, folks? I'm sure there's a lot that would like to find out what you're doing and follow you, especially if you're going to open up and start teaching others how to do this uh, so they could stay in touch with you. Uh, what's the best way to, to get a hold of you guys? Well, as Jimmy mentioned, we've got a YouTube channel. Just search Joint Ops Properties. You can also go to jointopsproperties.com. Um, we've got a ton of case studies up there, and, and you can subscribe to, uh, to to see a little bit more of the deals we're doing here in our local market. Um, you can also go to autopilotassets.com if you want to start learning how to do some lease option deals in your own market. And if you're curious about the using the whole life strategy, uh, you can find an IBC practitioner on their website. Just Google IBC practitioner. And if you want to use our guy, uh, search Ryan Lee at Paradigm Life or call Paradigm and ask for Ryan Lee. Got and then it. if you want to get a hold of us or email us, it's just jointopsproperties at gmail.com. Great, great. Wow. Well, this uh, this uh, episode has gone very quickly, and uh, I'm sure I could uh, ask you a million more questions, but uh, we're, we're trying to... Uh, trying to keep them within a certain time frame. But uh, gosh, you guys have really provided some great information, a lot of food for thought for our listeners. I, I can't thank you enough. Well, thanks for having us, Bill. Yeah, it's been great. Well, you bet. But uh, what's not over yet? Uh, you know, this is called the Old Dogs <laughs> <laughs> REI Network here. And, uh, um, you know, we have all of our guests uh, close us out with uh, the best old hound dog howl that they can do. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys, you know, our dog. Are you going to do it with us? Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, you make no, everybody no. else do it. I, yeah, I, I, do it. Okay. I think. No, I think I would just, you know, outshine everybody. I, it wouldn't be fair. It just wouldn't be fair. <laughs> but because uh, I, I howl every Friday when I do my own little thing here. But uh, <laughs> typically, I wait till the full moon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I, I don't know. I guess you guys could just both do that. Your howls together here. So uh, sounds good. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. All right. Ow! <laughs> All right, that was good, man. Right, same length. It sounded like it was just kind of an echo of the other guy. It was really We're good. So, we are so in sync with this business, yeah. Bill. It just translates to everything. <laughs> Synchronized howlers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Could be a new profession. No, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, gosh, it's been really great having you guys on, and I think our listeners are, are just thrilled about it. Uh, for all of those of you that are listening out there, we really appreciate you listening. We know there's a lot of things you can be doing right now, and the fact that you tuned into us uh, really means a lot, and we we appreciate that. Also, uh, to our great guests here, uh, we just uh, want to thank uh, Bob and Jim just for for coming in and and uh, sharing this information with you. Hopefully, you learned a lot, and there's uh, something there that you can take home with you and help you in your real estate uh, ventures ahead. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we just want to 
thank you guys uh, again for for coming on and i hope uh, everybody will contact you and get some get some good information to follow up on there sounds good thanks bill thank you well thank you guys Gosh, if you guys uh, like this podcast, we invite those uh, that uh, are listening just to, to go to iTunes or uh, Google Play or Stitcher, subscribe and rate our podcast. Uh, those are the kinds of things that help us to uh, get the podcast out to others and uh, and be able to offer this to to those that are seeking a, a way to be able to uh, augment their, their retirement and uh, hopefully have the retirement of their dreams. So uh, thank you so much again, guys, for, for being on. And to everybody else, uh, thank you for listening and God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.